Hello, mishpucha! Welcome back to my channel. It's Courtney, America's Jewish Mother. Um, I thought today I would do a discussion about star rating, since I know that's a conversation that's gone around the booktube community, although it was a few months ago already, but I'm new, so why not? Um, yeah, I definitely, I saw Greg from Supposedly Fun do a star ratings discussion, Doris from Aldi Books did one, Lindsay did one, Britta Bowler did one, I'm sure, I'm sure other people have done them too, but anyway, it seemed like a good thing to do while we're still in this getting to know you, getting to know all about you period of, of me being a newbie here on booktube to explain how I rate books. So I figured I would start from five stars and work my way down. So books that I have given or would give five stars to are things that tend to be very aesthetically pleasing in terms of the writing. They also tend to be books with very well rendered, well fleshed out, fully rounded characters. Um, a lot of times they're books that I feel like also taught me something important or gave me some sort of insight that I did not previously have about a particular community or about the human experience or about how we relate to each other, etc, etc. So books that I've given five stars to include Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, which is one of my all-time favorites. This prose is just so luminous. The story is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and I feel like this was a book that really opened my eyes to issues that I didn't even know existed in the African American community. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a really great book. Everyone should read this. So, um, that's Tony Morrison's Blue Eye. Another book I gave five stars to more recently, and this is in the, this is very thick because <laughs> it's the portable Oscar Wilde. Um, but, but in my gender and literature class in January, I had my students read The Picture of Dorian Gray. Um, and it had been a number of years since I read The Picture of Dorian Gray, and so I reread it while they were um, reading it. Um, and I gave that five stars as well. Um, it's, it's not really the kind of book where, like Toni Morrison, you're going to look at the world in an entirely new way um, or anything, but the writing is really gorgeous. It's extremely aesthetically pleasing. Um, the three main characters are all well rendered, fully developed characters. Um, and it's just a really interesting take on how to conduct your moral life from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, so yeah, Picture of Dorian Gray, also five star read for me. Um, and the last book I'm going to talk about that I gave five stars to um, is a collection of short stories by Ha Jin called The Bridegroom. Um, ha Jin is a really wonderful short story writer. Um, everything is just really well captured. Um, I've never, I don't know that I've ever read a short story from him where I was not sort of, where I, where I was just like, huh, what was the point of that? <laughs> um, he's just, he's really good. Um, and even though I don't think all 12 stories that are in this collection are, like, I don't think they're all at the same level of compelling, right? Like in every short story collection, you're going to have some that are better than others or some that you just like better than others. But I have to say, out of the 12 stories in this collection, not one of them is a dud. That's really impressive. Um, so yeah, for me, Bridegroom by Hajin, a five-star short story collection. Um, okay, so stuff that I would give like four and a half stars to um, would be things that I think, I basically think everyone should still read them, although maybe with like some slight reservation or something like that. So like, in my April uh, reading wrap-up, I gave four and a half stars to Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, which I found extremely accessible and very useful, except for the one chapter on Pierre Bourdieu and Habitus, which I thought was just sort of overly academic and unnecessary and made what was otherwise a very accessible text slightly al more alienating to the audience than necessary. Um, so I gave that four and a half stars. Um, 
Last year I read Evie Shockley's collection of poetry, The New Black, which I loved and I also gave that four and a half stars. Um, I really liked it because I have a good, pretty good grounding in African American history and literature and so I was able to understand a lot of the references that she makes in her poems, but I understand that if you don't go into this poetry collection with that grounding, you're probably not going to get as much out of it. And I think most people are not willing to sit through a poetry collection where they have to Google something, Google a reference, um, you know, every, every other line or anything like that. Um, and the other thing about it that I liked, but that I realized not everyone would like, is the fact that um, it's, it's, very, it's very good in terms of, of being something that's um, the, being something that, that you would like to read if you're into experimental or avant-garde kind of poetry. Um, and I like linguistic experimentation in poetry. I think poetry is an excellent vehicle for linguistic experimentation. So I liked that not all of the poems had the same structure or format. They were all different. Um, I was introduced to some new forms that I didn't even know existed thanks to this collection. But again, I realized that that's not uh, desirable or accessible to everyone, so I gave that four and a half stars. Um, okay, so on to four star reads. So four star reads are basically, I really liked this a lot and I felt compelled to keep reading it, um, but maybe there were some some problems with it. Um, just, just a few, but I still would highly recommend it. So things that I've given four stars to include uh, Cynthia Ozick's collection of essays called The Din in the Head. Um, Cynthia Ozick writes with her, first of all, her prose is very, it's very aesthetically pleasing. So I think of the, the three of the four four star books I'm going to talk about here, um, what they all have in common is aesthetically pleasing prose. Um, so yes, her prose is very aesthetically pleasing. She has a deep understanding of the subjects that she writes about. She writes with great nuance and attention to detail. Um, but again, I also realized that she also writes about some subjects that are more arcane and very academic and would not necessarily be something that a majority of readers would want to read about. Um, so just to give you a sense of, of what she writes on. Um, she's got essays, these are all critical essays by the way, so she's got stuff about Tolstoy, she's got stuff about John Updike, um, Sylvia Plath, so those are, those are figures that I think a lot of readers would be interested to, you know, read about and maybe know something about. But then she also writes about Saul Bellow, she also writes about Delmore Schwartz, she also writes about Lionel Trilling, um, she writes about Isaac Babel, and you know, it's just not not all of these figures are going to be people that, that most readers um, are going to find appealing or particularly accessible. Um, so even though, again, she writes very well um, and with a good attention to detail and a keen understanding of her subject matter and what she wants to convey, it's not always going to be something that would appeal to a lot of people. So I gave that four stars. Um, I also gave four stars to, this is a library copy of Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, which I really liked a lot. Again, the prose is very aesthetically pleasing. I think it's a really good exploration of interpersonal relationships and human nature and how not understanding who you are and not accepting who you are can really hamper basically the entire rest of your life and keep you from finding and and having meaningful relationships. Um, but yeah, I, th this is a novella also and I feel like probably some of the relationships between characters could have been more fully fleshed out had this been a longer book. Um, but yeah, otherwise really good four stars. Um, I also would give four, I also have given four stars to Toni Morrison's Sula. Again, very beautifully rendered prose. The characters are pretty well developed. The thing about Sula is that it's so short. It's only...
174 pages. So it's not very long, um, but it spans a lot of time and characters. And so even though I feel like the characters are pretty well developed, it's, it's a little all over the place. Like, the book is called Sula, but Sula doesn't feature all that heavily until part two of the book, which is weird. Um, and in fact, in, in rereading this book with my students, I had read it in graduate school and really liked it a lot, but I remembered it focusing more heavily on the relationship between Nell and Sula, and while that does figure some in part one of the book, it really does not come to the fore until part two. And I was like, huh, that's weird. <laughs> um, so again, this is a book I gave four stars to. Um, same same with, with Amor Tolls A Gentleman in Moscow. It's very well written. I found it super charming. I gave it four stars, but I did not feel that the Count as a character was a particularly well-rounded character. Um, he was just, he was too good. And the other characters in the book were sort of, you know, they were just kind of one-dimensional. And again, even though... It's a very charming book, and it was very enjoyable for me to read, and I felt like it was good quarantine reading. There was just that aspect of it that kept me from giving it higher than, than four stars. But again, four stars is still really good. It still means I, I would recommend, I would highly recommend it. Uh, all right, so moving on to three and a half and three stars. So three and a half stars for me is like, this is sort of the baseline for I liked it, I recommend it. Um, if I give a book three stars, for me that's more like, I didn't love it, I didn't dislike it, it was okay. I would, I would probably recommend it, but I think it's also kind of forgettable. Um, so yeah, so some books that I've given three stars to include Harry Kemmelman's Friday the Rabbi Slept Late, which is the first in the Rabbi Small's um, series, or Rabbi Small series. Um, this is about a, a rabbi who basically be becomes like an amateur detective um, and helps the police to solve crimes. So there's one for every day of the week in this series. So the first one is Friday the Rabbi Slept Late. And uh, let's see if it tells me what this is followed by. No, it doesn't. You'll just have to look it up if you're interested. But yeah, so I, I, I liked it. I enjoyed it while I was reading it. But again, I did not find it particularly memorable. And I didn't like it enough to feel compelled to continue in the series. Um, another book I gave three stars to was Hodgin's novel, A Map of Betrayal. Now, I think the premise of this book is actually quite good. It's about a um, a man who basically becomes a spy for the Chinese government. So he's kind of living this double life. Um, he lives most of his life. He has to leave his family behind in China. He eventually makes his way to the United States and he lives out the rest of his days in the United States. He never gets to go back to China or his, his original family ever again. And so you see him try to build a life for himself in the United States, but at the same time, it's with all of this deception because he's doing all of this, this spy work for um, the Chinese government. And so it's really sad. And then after his, um, after his death, which this is not a spoiler or anything like this is mentioned at the beginning of the book, um, his daughter Lillian tries to, to trace um, the, her father's history because she finds all this stuff. She's like, what is this, you know? Um, and then slowly she sort of uncovers the fact that he had he had another family in China and things like that. So anyway, so I found the, the plot of it very compelling, but I just didn't feel like the characters were were really fully fleshed out or or rendered in a way that made me like really remember where they were coming from or understand um understand all of their motivations like i remember the two main characters names there was gary the father and lily and the daughter but i also only read this book in like december so it hasn't been that long ago um but i don't really remember i can't i can't really tell you oh gary is this kind of character or lillian is this kind of character which i think means that again they were not 
fully fleshed out. So, you know, if you if the plot of this interests you, but you don't really care about, you know, characterization, or you don't care as much about characterization, then sure, it's three stars. I would recommend it. But if you, you know, really care more about characterization, then I maybe wouldn't recommend it. Um, Alright, so moving on to some two and a half and two star reads for me. Um, so this is one that I talked about in my April wrap up. So for me, if I rate a book under three stars, I don't recommend it. Or I might recommend it under very specific circumstances and I feel like it has a lot more flaws than it has um, merits. So Clifford Odette's Waiting for Lefty and Other Plays falls into that category. So out of six plays, that were in this collection. I only, one of them I think I would, I gave four stars to, one of them was three and a half, one of them was three, and all the other ones were two. So overall this was a two and a half star collection for me. So it's like, yeah, I recommend the one play that I thought was quite good, which is Till the Day I Die, and I, you know, maybe semi-recommend the other two, um, uh, Golden Boy and what was the other one? Rocket to the Moon. But the other ones I felt like the, the characters were forgettable, um, they don't, they're not fully fleshed out, um, and yeah, I just, I didn't feel like the other plays were, were good or particularly memorable. In fact, I couldn't tell you anything about them right now, so, um, that is why I gave this two and a half stars overall, and so, if you wanted to read those one, those, you know, particular plays, I would probably recommend those, but I don't recommend the collection as a whole. Alright, on to things I gave two stars to. So one of these was a book I read in January called Cottage for a Child Not Born by Imre Curtis. I'm not sure if that's, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and this is a slim little volume. It wasn't even 100 pages long and I seriously considered DNFing it because I just did not enjoy the reading experience at all. Now, this is a this is a book that is is told from the perspective of a main character who is a survivor of the death camps and he basically basically the entire novel is just him like it's just one long monologue from the main character um and he is a well rendered character in the sense that i i recognize his struggles in the sense that he's very in his head and he has all of these intellectual pursuits that are clearly covering up this repressed emotional trauma that he has suffered. Um, but I just did not like the reading experience at all. I just wanted him to stop talking. <laughs> because again, it's like all this intellectualization and rationalization that's covering up your emotional trauma. Deal with your trauma. <laughs> Just wanted to like take the main character and shake him. So, um, so yeah, for a book that was that was fewer than hundred pages, I seriously wanted to DNF it. Um, so yeah, but again, I felt like the the main character was well rendered, so that's why I gave it two stars instead of one. But I don't recommend it, generally speaking. Um, similarly, Joan Richardson's A Natural History of Pragmatism. So this is a non-fiction academic book about American pragmatism, as implied by the title. Um, now my advisor loves this book, absolute, or my former advisor <laughs> loves this book. I loathe and detest this book, <laughs> however, I feel like if my former advisor likes it, it has to have some sort of merit to it, and I did use parts of this in my dissertation. So I'm giving it two stars instead of one. Um, but here's the thing about Joan Richardson. She's very impenetrable. I have studied pragmatism for years and I find this book really difficult to penetrate and really hard to understand. And she makes all these references on every page, multiple times on every page. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? So I just feel like this is the kind of book where it's really only meant for a very select group of people and I am not included in that group despite the fact that again I've studied pragmatism for years because I feel like if I've studied pragmatism for years and I still find your academic work on it inaccessible, that's not a good sign. <laughs> um, so yeah, two stars. 
And then the last book I'm going to talk about, I do not have here with me, so I will put the title over here. Um, it is a book that I, is the only book I gave one star to last year, and that is John Warner's Why They Can't Write, um, which is a nonfiction book that was published within the last couple of years. Now, ostensibly, this book is intended for an academic audience and is talking about problems in writing that college students have and why they have those problems in writing. I hated this book. <laughs> this book is terrible. It has no idea who its audience is. A lot of the recommendations it offers are meant for people who teach college like me, but some of the recommendations are aimed at high school teachers. I don't have any control over what high school teachers do. Some of the recommendations are aimed at politicians and government officials. Again, I don't have any control over what those people do. And then some of the recommendations are things that I also don't have control over because it's the college student's responsibility, like getting enough sleep or having access to appropriate food to eat. Again, those are not things I have control over. So. I just feel like it was too all over the place in terms of its audience, and the research was shoddy. This was a book that was published by, I think, John Hopkins University Press, and I am frankly outraged that this was published by a university press, because the research is terrible. He uses research on composition from the 1970s, hello, we're way past then. There's been a lot of work in the interim from me to Shaughnessy to present. Um, and yeah, he just, he does not use anything that's, that's relevant or current or contemporary. And he just makes all these statements um, that again, are not grounded in research at all. And some of them really apply more to creative writing type courses than they would to first year composition. And again, ostensibly his subject is to tell you why college students are unprepared or underprepared to write and why or and like how we can when how we can help them fix that in a first year composition classroom setting but he doesn't deliver that so yeah the audience is unclear the research is sloppy the message is basic it's super basic so i don't know why this book got all this hype but Never read John Warner's Why They Cannot Write, unless, or Why They Can't Write, unless you want to read, again, just basic, badly researched crap. So, <laughs> all right, so rant over. All right, so that is my discussion of star ratings from The Really Good, which I learned something. They told me something about human nature and the human experience. They had really beautiful aesthetically pleasing prose all the way down to the the mid-level of three stars of okay it's fine it's not great it's not terrible it's just okay as matthew sharapa would say all the way down to one stars of this is horrible this is trash it's um it has all of these flaws don't ever read it i don't recommend it to anyone so yes that is my discussion of star ratings please feel free to drop a comment down below and tell me um, how you like to rate things in terms of star ratings, whether you agree with anything I've said about star ratings or whether you have different criteria or standards that you use for your own star ratings. Um, hope you're all staying healthy and well. I hope you're getting some good reading in in our first week of May. And until next time, would it kill you to call your mother?